Dean's Blue Hole, Long Island, Bahamas, November 17th, 2013. The warm Atlantic sloshed in Nicholas Maboli's ears as he floated into the competition zone at Dean's Blue Hole. He looked calm, but appearances can be deceiving. When Vertical Blue kicked off, he had ambitions for a bronze medal and two more American records. Yet after a year of intense preparation and winning an overall gold in another competition only weeks earlier, plus silver at the World Championship a month before that, he proceeded to flub every single dive that week. This was the Wimbledon of free diving. Aside from Worlds, it was the only competition that mattered to him and most others in the sport, and Nick was out of juice. Every muscle in his body hurt, even his lungs hurt, but he wasn't about to give up. It was game day, and he was preparing to descend to 72 meters, or 240 feet, and back on a single breath. Six minutes, announced Sam Trubridge, a theater director from Auckland, New Zealand, and the older brother of William Trubridge, the greatest freediver of them all. Standing on the platform, Sam loomed over Nick, who lay on his back, clipped to the competition line. His eyes stayed mostly closed, but when he opened them, they flashed with focus and determination. The competition zone was delineated by a set of white PVC pipes that formed a six meter square within the, dark, within the dark blue of the hole. Inside were a photographer, a videographer, and three judges, including lead judge Grant Graves, one of the longest tenured professionals in the sport. Also within the zone were five safety divers clad in long bifins led by Nick's friend, Ren Chapman, a former college baseball star from Wilmington, North Carolina. It was the safety diver's job to meet the athletes once they'd reached a depth of 30 meters while ascending from their dive. That's where pressure underwater shifts and where lactic acid buildup and hypoxia, or lack of oxygen, can begin to cause problems. Clinging to the floating boundaries were a handful of fans and several of Nick's rivals, folks like Mike Board, 44, the UK record holder and a former Royal Marine. Half Chinese, half English, six feet tall and all muscle, Mike patrolled the infamous Baghdad Airport Road as a private military contractor during the Iraq War and earned good money dodging suicide attacks and ferrying high dollar clients to the safety of the green zone. Afterwards, he used his earnings to build a flourishing free dive center in Indonesia's Gili Islands, which enabled him to train year round. In terms of global standing within the sport, Mike and Nick were among the elite national record holders and both hoped to be contending for world records soon. Also in the water was Junko Kitahama, another national record holder from Japan. She watched him carefully. Their conversation on the beach had thrown her, and she was worried. Five minutes, so were his friends and family. They were aware that Nick was hurting, and they also knew that when others took breaks, he doubled down on training. While many kept a less ambitious competition schedule, Nick Mavoli took every opportunity to, every opportunity to dive. That's what made him the best American freediver in less than two years of competition. But mulling past victories wasn't going to help him now. Frustrated, he clenched his eyes tight to silence his brain speak, to switch off and calm down. He took a cleansing breath and leaned back, submerging his face, stimulating the nerves around his eyes, and sparking the mammalian dive reflex, a physiological response that, if developed, helped an average man become Aquaman, capable of freediving to unheard of depths for minutes at a time, without feeling any anxiety or the slightest urge to breathe. Four minutes, he inhaled long and slow and exhaled twice as slow, twice as calm, each time purging his system of negativity and carbon dioxide, the buildup of which spurs that urge to breathe and can turn a relaxed, peaceful adventure into excruciating toil. If a stray bolt of fear bloomed in his mind, he'd slow his breath down even more. That was the only way to lower his heart rate and keep his demons at bay. Three minutes, he knew them well, his demons. They had trailed him his entire life. They fueled him. His broken home, his feelings of inadequacy, his frustration with a society attuned to greed and waste were what drove him into the water in the first place. They also blessed him with uncommon generosity. On land, Nick wasn't the fierce competitor he was on the line. And beneath all of that anxiety, pain and loss, brain chatter and seawater sloshing in his ears, he knew something else too. He had one more dive left in him and he was going to tear that Velcro tag from the bottom plate, come up clean and claim his record. Two minutes, he visualized the dive something his friend William Trubridge, a 15-time world record holder and owner of Vertical Blue, taught him when they'd roomed together during the Caribbean Cup in Honduras the previous May, where Nick made the dive of his life and became the first American to swim to 100 meters in, on a single breath. He used a monofin that day. On Sunday, November 17th, he would dive without fins, which ratcheted up the difficulty several degrees. Will stood on the beach, barefoot as usual, watching Nick breathe up. Typically, he stayed away from the hole when he wasn't diving, 
but he didn't miss Nick's dives. Nobody in the history of the sport had gotten to 100 meters so fast, and Will knew he was witnessing someone special, someone capable of breaking world records one day and going deeper than any human had before. One minute, as the clock ticked below 30 seconds, Nick's breathing pattern changed and he began sipping the air, attempting to fill his lungs to the limit, from the depth of his diaphragm to those little used air pockets between and behind the shoulder blades, and in so doing, pack as much oxygen into his system as possible. He would need it. If all went according to plan, he wouldn't breathe again for nearly three minutes. Dean's Blue Hole bloomed onto the freediving scene in 2005, when Will began living and training there. At the time, he was not yet a champion, but an aspirant, frustrated by the lack of accessibility to deep water and good conditions on a consistent basis. He found both on Long Island, Bahamas, and within a few short years, he became one of the best, if not the best freediver on Earth. Freedivers soon flocked to train alongside him, and those that were instructors brought students. That's how Nick found it in 2012, when he was about to come out of nowhere to break his first American record. 81 miles long, but less than four miles across at its widest point, Long Island is splayed like a twisted egg noodle between the frothing blue Atlantic Ocean and the placid turquoise Caribbean Sea. Etched from limestone by wind, surf, and rain, its stubby hills and plains are blanketed in thick tropical scrub, rustling with wild boar and feral cats, stitched with mangroves, and blessed with a series of exquisite virgin beaches. On his maiden voyage in 1492, Christopher Columbus navigated the northern tip of Long Island. He named it Fernandina, anchoring on the Caribbean side of what became known as Cape Santa Maria. A single strip of asphalt leads from there towards the southern terminus, and after about an hour's drive, in the town of Deans, a gravel and dirt road branches east over low-lying hills and around a bend to Will's beloved Blue Hole, where the wind is almost always muffled and the current ever gentle, even in stormy weather. That's because it's sheltered by a concave semicircle of thick limestone that rises over 50 feet high. Its insides, grooved with giant primordial brushstrokes, are drilled with shallow caves and punctuated by phallic stalactites that dangle over a sea so dark blue it has no business being just three steps from a silky white sand beach, where Will stood watching as the clock wound down on Nicholas Mavoli. Sam ticked off the seconds. Ten, nine, eight. When he got to zero, Nick submerged. Face first with his arms extended, he looked like a human arrow shooting into the darkness. Dean's Blue Hole is an underwater cavern flipped vertically, shaped like a carafe. As Nick swam, he passed a rugged reef which sprouted from sloping white sand that led to a ring of sheer limestone 10 meters below the surface. He'd reached the rim of the hole where sand spilled over the edge in a series of mesmerizing sandfalls that look exactly like a photo negative of a waterfall. Within five prow powerful breaststrokes, those cliff walls receded beneath a sloped ceiling where small schools of giant tarpon or silver barracuda often hunkered in the shadows. After another few strokes and another 10 meter drop, there was a second set of cliffs and the walls receded again. Soon the hole was darker than midnight and about twice as wide as the entire cove appears from the surface. The rim of the hole has a 35 meter diameter. Below 20 meters, the diameter is estimated more, at more than 150 meters. Nick had stopped swimming by then his arms at his side, his chin tucked. He became as streamlined as possible. It was time to free fall, the part of a dive that feels like floating through outer space. He closed his eyes and surrendered to the soft, slow sink into dream time. So that's, <laughs> that's how the book starts. Um, and I was, I was at the Blue Hole that day. I was there covering Vertical Blue, uh, the, the competition for the New York Times sports page. And um, it's a roundabout way how I got there, but I was there just to do kind of a midweek feature. There wasn't even really a firm deadline on the assignment. It was gonna run at some point during like the football playoffs. They were just gonna have this feature. And when Nick died, um, obviously it became something else entirely. It became a breaking news story for a couple of days and ended up all over the world. It went crazy viral. Uh, because people are interested in this sport, interested in what freediving is, I think. Uh, you know, not just because it's extreme, but because it's something that we've all tried to do. So I thought, you know, when Ben and I met last year and then he started working here, I just thought it was, you know, a really great opportunity we both did to talk about it because it's a captivating sport where people are doing things we've all tried to do, hold our breath as long as possible, and maybe swim the length of a pool or kick down when we're snorkeling to a reef. Um, and here are people going deeper than scuba divers can go with a tank. 
much deeper. It's not even close. Uh, and they're doing it on one breath. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about what free diving is. And uh, Ben could help with that since sure. he's as much a free diver as a Googler. That's true. Well, I've uh, been free diving um, for about eight years now, and then scuba diving for probably eight years before that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is sort of a very intellectual sport. You have to do a lot of fine tuning and a lot of sort of thinking. It's mind over matter to, uh, to do some of these things that, that you need to do free diving. Um, I tried at first to sort of teach myself. I was scuba diving a lot, and then on the last day of a scuba trip, you're not supposed to uh, dive and fly on the same day, so I would go out and snorkel some of the same reefs and see something you know, 30, 40, 50 feet down that I wanted to go take a look at, and I'd try to go down, and I'd get 20 feet down and feel like I had to breathe and have to turn around, and my ears would hurt. And uh, um, so it, it was something where you know, there, were, there was more to it than that. I knew that some people were able to do really amazing stuff underwater. And I, I, I really wanted to figure that out. So when uh, the dive shop that I do my scuba diving with, Malibu Divers, uh, hosted a free diving course, just a weekend course with uh, uh, an outfit called Performance Free Diving, uh, I, I signed up for that. And uh, in one weekend, I doubled my breath hold time and I doubled my depth I was able to get to in the ocean and just got completely hooked. And so from that intermediate course, then I went on to an advanced course. And from there, uh, went on to do some local competitions, which eventually led to joining the US team. And I, I was uh, competed in the world championships in, in 2010 through 2012. And uh, after that, was a safety diver uh, for various competitions, uh, especially at, at Vertical Blue. I was a safety diver in 2011, 2012. I actually was supposed to go 2013, and I missed it. So I was not there when the incident with, with Nick happened. But I was there in 2014, uh, the year after, where uh, the safety was suddenly uh, uh, taken just amazingly seriously. And we had a, a wonderful safety team. Um, Grant Graves is here, by the way. He was uh, the head judge for a lot of these competitions and has been part of the sport for, for a, a very long time. He's probably the most experienced freediving judge and, and expert that, that there is. Um, also, Tank Said is here, who's a friend of Nick's and uh, an Australian national record holder. So they could take yeah. questions at some point as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, to set up what the sport is and what, all the th what he's talking about, I think it's I important. So before, we, I, I, um, who here has tried to hold their breath in the pool as long as possible? And who has tried to swim from one end of the pool and back on a single breath? and either done it or not, right? Oh, everybody, it's kind of like this universal human activity. And free diving has been going on for millennia. So it's not this, even though there's this growing popularity that has happened, you know, ancient Greek and ancient Rome, they had like these early underwater Navy SEAL team type things that they'd deploy and they'd build underwater barricades. There's sponge divers, pearl divers, uh, spear fishermen that, you know, people still live off of spear fishing in Indonesia and Africa and Med Mediterranean, all over the world. And so uh, this is something humans have always been able to do and, and have used. Uh, what competitive freediving, that kind of started in the 40s. Um, and originally, the competition was using weights to get down as deep as possible. So it was always, who's the deepest? Who's the deepest? And often, they would, they'd be weighted, they'd drop weights, and they'd swim back. That's a discipline that we call variable weight now in competitive freediving. But uh, the competitive freediving that we depict in this book, which is Really, the, the, that's what the, the that's these are the six events that are used in competitive freediving. There's three that are in the pool. There's static, which is holding your breath as long as you can, face down in a pool. The world record's 11 minutes and 54 seconds, so that's pretty long. <laughs> the second uh, is dynamic, which you're wearing a monofin, which are those kind of dolphin-like tail fins with two feet in, this, in 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 one fin. And dynamic, that record, I think it's still 281 meters, right? Goran Cholak. And then there's uh, dy dynamic with no fins, which is the same idea, trying to go as, as long as possible, not as deep as possible, front end of the pool and back, and you do that as long as possible without fins, and that's a breaststroke. And so the, again, they're underwater, they're weighted with their neck, so they can, they're not allowed to eclipse, eclipse the surface of the water. That's what Tank was so good at as well, those two, those, you know, the, 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 pool, the pool disciplines. Um, but pool disciplines are also training for the deep divers because the reason you want to build up your static as a diver is the, if you hold your breath for, say, five minutes 
in static or at the surface, you can swim for two and a half minutes on one breath down below. I mean, that's the simple formula. And so you want to develop that static ability if you want to dive deep. And same with dynamic, because you're training your body to withstand lactic acid buildup and carbon dioxide buildup in your body. And so the deep divers do the pool for training. But uh, the three disciplines in deep free diving are constant weight, which is just, they call it constant weight because any weight you bring down with you, you, can bring, you have to bring back up. But constant weight is with a monofin. And that record's 128 meters, held by Alexei Molchanov. And uh, Will Truebridge has the two other world records on the men's side. And those are with free immersion, which is you pull down on a line, down to depth, and then you pull back to the surface, no fins. And then constant no fins, which is what uh, Nick was doing when he passed away. And that record is 101 meters, and that's a modified breaststroke down and back. Uh, the free immersion record is 121 meters. On the women's side, it was dominated by Alexei Molchanov's mother, Natalia Molchanova, who is, uh, was just the most decorated athlete in the history of the sport, the greatest female freediver of all time, has every single record. Um, and she, she passed away last year. Um, and she passed away in a very different sort of way than, than what happened with Nick. What happened with Nick was, um, and it obviously gets into, get, gets into the book, but he, uh, he was diving injured. And then he went down and came back on his own at the surface and, and was, appeared to be breathing for a full minute before he blacked out. Blacking out is not so, that uncommon in competitive freediving. It's not, it doesn't happen the majority of the time at all. But in competitive freediving, especially at places like Vertical Blue and the World Championships where people are really pushing their limits and the pressure is high, you can use your oxygen store prematurely, even if you've trained to a certain level. So, you know, people do black out. And that's why there are safety divers around. And because of the physics of freediving, you're not going to black out at depth. It's always when you're coming t back towards the surface or at the surface. 90% of freedivers will black out at the surface. 9% of them will be, be you know, shallower than 10 meters. And less than 1% will be below that. But the safety divers will swim down to about 30 or you know, sometimes even 40 meters to meet a diver and swim back with them on the way back up. That's, you know, that's, that's why there are safety divers there. And people do get black out underwater, and they're brought up, and they come around right away. Um, but usually, you're going to black out in the first or second breath at the surface. And Nick didn't. And so what happened to Nick is something nobody had ever seen before in the history of the sport. What happened with, with Natalia was something that happens to something like 100 spear fishermen every year. She was, she was diving virtually alone. The people that she had been diving with were not equipped to safety her. She got caught in an underwater current and came up and blacked out shallow water, and they never found her. So that's more like how a lot of spear fishermen do pass away doing this sport. It's not because of the extreme of depth. It's because they're holding their breath a little bit too long for where maybe they've done too many dives that day. They're tired. It could be any number of reasons, but there's nobody there to protect them. Uh, the blackout itself is not dangerous. It's blacking out alone that is so dangerous. But with Nick's story, it's different. That's what made it, that's what made it uh, such an interesting story to write about. You know, you start with his death, and you go back through his life story. And his life story is so interesting, too. And then you get back and forth from 2013 to the 2014 freediving season. Uh, where the whole sport has changed, and we're trying to figure out what happened to Nick and what the sport can do. And that's kind of when uh, Ben and I met in, in, in Vertical Blue that next year. But, uh, you know, so the, I just wanted to give you guys the whole picture of, of what this competitive freediving world is all about. Um, but, you know, competitive freediving is just one aspect of it. It's also just recreational. So anywhere that you might go scuba diving in the world where there's a bunch of scuba centers, there's also now freediving centers popping up all over the world. I don't know what... Do we know how, how fast it's grown in the last few years? I mean, it, it's just grown exponentially. Um, I know that. Is, are there numbers on that at all? There's, there's no hard numbers in the industry for scuba, so we haven't covered, but it's tripled in uh, the last number of years. Tripled. And then also PADI, which is the scuba diving, uh, kind of the main scuba diving, I guess, what would you call it, like um, association? Something like that, yeah. They now have their, yeah, 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 right. And they now have certification body. Now they have a freediving uh, curriculum, too. So it just shows you that it's, it's growing. And some of those hobbyists become athletes. And, and um, I think before I turn back to Ben, one thing about these competitions is they're kind of like triathlons would be or, or, ten, or like runs would be. There's weekend warriors that are just trying to get their own personal best a little bit better, and they're serious about it, but they're not real contenders. Then there's the national record holders and the world record holders. But what's unique about this sport is 
if you are a world record holder, you might also have to be the guy blocking off the roads, you know, if you were a triathlete. Imagine like the best triathlete in the world blocking off the roads in Kona before the Ironman, you know, like that's basically what these guys are doing. They're elite, elite athletes. They're on, in my opinion, the best of them are on par with uh, Olympic swimmers. That's the athletic ability we're talking about here. Um, if you saw them walk in, you can always tell when an elite free diver's in the room, it looks like an elite athlete, you know, covering athletes like I have, um, it, you, you can tell. And so, so that's my, that's where I, that's how I kind of feel about it. Uh, and that's the sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to mention something a little counterintuitive about free diving in the ocean, which is that uh, for most people, um, the limiting factor in how, in how deep you can go uh, is not about breath hold. I think that it would seem intuitive that it's about how long you can hold your breath, and the longer you can hold your breath, the deeper you can go. Uh, but actually adapting to the pressure as you go down is really the limiting factor for most people. And through most of the history of the sport, uh, everyone sort of figured out, mostly for themselves, how to go about acclimating to the, to the pressure as they went deeper and figuring out tricks to get deeper. And that sort of changed a few years ago when some people developed uh, techniques that were more teachable for how to, to use certain tricks to get down to depth a lot quicker. And so suddenly, beginners were able to use these techniques to go much deeper than they were really ready for. And I think that, that's gone over extensively in the book. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that's a good way. We should talk a little bit about what the appeal is, right? Like, why would you? You know, if, if it's just an ego trip, like, what's the point of writing a book about, like, this, this kind of group of, of weirdos that are trying to go as deep as possible just for their own ego trip? That's not what this is, you know? I, I like to talk about what happens on the dive itself to give you an idea of why these athletes want to dive over and over again. And, and so when you start at the surface, uh, you, you'll, they'll actually an athlete will prepare to dive for up to an hour before the dive itself, and they'll just relax as deeply as possible, get the heart rate down as deep as, as, as slow as possible. Because the breath that they're going to take, that peak inhalation, where they'll, they'll fill their lungs and then they'll continue to pack air and use their tongue as a piston to push more air down into their lungs so they kind of overinflate their lungs, some of them up to 20% above their normal lung capacity. Um, they're doing that, and that's their oxygen tank. And so that's all the oxygen they've got, right? We all know oxygen is how our cells work, right? It's, 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 that's our fuel. So that's all they've got to get down and back. Uh, and then they'll kick, and you have to kick hard to get down uh, because you're dealing with positive buoyancy, right? And we've all done that. We've all tried to kick down, and you're like, whoa, I'm not getting anywhere. And so they have to kick hard till about neutral buoyancy, and it depends on how they're weighted, but it's around 10 meters. And then they can kick softer, and they'll continue to go down. And after 20, 25 meters, they'll stop kicking altogether, and they'll just start sinking. That's that free fall. And they'll sink at about a, minute, a meter per second, just about. So this slow, soft sink. And most will just close their eyes and surrender to it because thoughts also burn oxygen. So you want to keep that brain so, so blank. And then the physiological hacks start coming in. And that's what is known as the mammalian dive reflex. And it's called that because that's how seals and sea lions dive deep too. So the same kind of thing can happen in the human body. And that is a few things that happen is that the veins and arteries in your arms and legs constrict and it floods the blood to your core because your lungs are also getting squeezed, or getting, they're, they're compressing. And so at, ten, at the surface, we have 100% of our lung capacity. At 10 meters, because of barometric pressure, we have half that lung capacity. 20 meters, it's a third, and so on, all the way down the line, till your lungs are the size of a tennis ball. And so that blood starts to engorge the pulmonary arteries, the veins, and your core. Um, and that also contributes to a reduction in heart rate that's about half your resting heart rate. So we're talking about elite athletes, right? So they're going to be in the 50s, probably. So now all of a sudden, you're having a heart rate in the 20s and 30s as you sink down. And that's something that's really only been recorded in Buddhist monks in the laboratory. You know, that's the kind of level we're getting at. And so then they keep sinking, they keep sinking. And if you go super deep, nar nitrogen narcosis can pop in, which is if you've ever scuba dove and you've done, gone to any depth, you might feel that. And it's kind of like this psychedelic thing that's happening. And so they're super relaxed, their heart rate's down, they get to the bottom plate, they pull the tag, and they have to kick back against that negative buoyancy, that pressure that has shifted and it started sinking down. Now they have to kick back against that, which is like kicking through a swift current. And they've already been underwater, I mean, for half the amount of time they're planning. 
And so now is the time to kick, and that's the athletic portion. So now they're kicking hard, they're kicking hard, they're kicking hard. And as they get back to the surface, and if, if they can get back to the surface under their own power, which is almost every time, the first breath, they take that first breath, all of a sudden that endorphin rush comes on. So you've had this kind of psychedelic spiritual experience augmented by this endorphin rush, and it's a euphoric, exhilarating experience, obviously. It's like this feeling that kind of vibrate in your body and your mind, and it's why people are addicted to it. And it's why people like Nick or like Ben, you feel that one time. Or even, even a beginner like me, when I first started doing this, it took like, took like 15 instructors to get me, <laughs> get me down to a decent depth. I ended up getting to 100 feet. But I remember this one time when I went down to about 50 feet. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to breathe at that point. I didn't have to go up. I didn't have to breathe. I was so comfortable. And for the rest of the day, every time I closed my eyes, I'd see that blue world. And you know, when, when divers go even deeper than that, when, they, when they're below 50 meters, time slows down even more. Often it feels like the sea is squeezing them, and they become just this speck of consciousness in this vast abyss. And it's, it's all part of that allure. So that's why people do this, you know, because it's a beautiful experience. You can only get this way. And uh, I think that's really important, because not only are they great athletes, a lot of people like you said, it's this intellectual problem, right? It's a problem that continually needs to be solved. You talked about limiting factors. Maybe you can talk about um, kind of how everyone might have a different limiting factor and how you try to always solve the equation of going a little bit deeper. Sure. I mean, it's, some of it, it can be psychological where you can get down to a certain depth and suddenly just have the thought of, you know, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm 100 feet underwater, you know, and, and you sort of freak out and turn around. Uh, there's various uh, physiological aspects where you, that can kick in the urge to breathe, even if you have plenty of, of oxygen. Uh, so overcoming some of those limitations. Um, just getting to that point where you can just relax and not fight against the pressure that's sort of pushing on you. Uh, it takes a while to get calm enough to, you know, to, to adapt to that. But you know, I, I will second the fact that the, uh, the, the free fall stage, when you, you've kicked down uh, 50, 60, 70 feet, um, and you can just start sinking is just completely addictive, probably the same way that, that free fall would be in, in skydiving. Um, and so, you know, being able to get to the point, and it, it takes quite a bit of, of, of work to get to the point where you're going deep enough to experience that, but it really is magical. Um, yeah, and, it's, it, and that's, you know, it takes reps. Also, you know, it's like life is reps, in my opinion, life is reps. You need to have the reps. You need to get in the water. You need to do it over and over. The more you do it, the more you love it kind of thing. I think that's how, you, how I would put it, don't you think? Sure, it, yeah, it yeah, is. Uh, yeah. and, and it's uh, when you've been out of the water for a while and you go back into it, usually the first day or two or three is, you know, you have to start much shallower than you were you're doing the last time. I mean, when I'm at my peak in, in free diving, I've been down close to 70 meters. Uh, but when I start off on a dive trip the first day, I'll go to, you know, maybe 30 meters. And that will feel like a lot of work because my body is not adapted to it yet. And so it can be kind of depressing the first day off on a dive trip. But usually it comes back fairly quickly and then, um, you know, pacing yourself to sort of reach your limits again. And, uh, yeah, for these guys that, uh, like, like William Truebridge, who lives at the Blue Hole and trains there 11 months out of the year, or, or you know, trains freediving, um, you know, a huge amount of the time, uh, he can just adapt to the point of going. I mean, he's, he's been down over 120 meters, which is almost double what I've done. Yeah, but 67 is no joke. I mean, 67 meters is 200, you know, 200 feet plus, right? So, About 220. Yeah, 220. So, I mean, that's, that's heavy and, duty. Uh, <laughs> on, on the breath hold front, uh, my, my deepest dive, which was 67 meters, was it, it took about a minute and 15 seconds on the way down, and about 50 seconds on the way back up. So the whole dive time was just over two minutes. So a dive like that is really less about breath hold and more about um, just adapting to the pressure. I mean, I, I felt comfortable on that dive all the way to the bottom. I think I could have gone a little deeper. And that's the other aspect of the sport is that once you successfully make a dive to your, especially if it's a personal best, and you come back and you think, oh, I could have gone just a tiny bit deeper than that, and that drives you to just, you know, Right, and, and, and it's a brain loop, right? So that's what I think another interesting point of the, of the book is where Nick kind of 
it was, it was a perfect example of what a lot of divers feel is every di no, no dive is good enough. There's always another dive out there. There's a, and some just crunch numbers, and they might stay, William Trubridge is a perfect example. He'll stare at his computer and his dive profiles for hours to try to edge out another meter um, because it's just part of the, it's this self-feeding loop, right? And um, with Nick, it was, he, he, it was a little self-destructive. Um, you know, there, there's a r lot of reasons that what happened that day, but he, uh, there were about eight or nine things that could have gone differently. Some of them were in Nick's control, some of them were not. Um, and uh, that's what makes it, you know, any sort of tragedy, whether it's a plane crash or anything else, often you hear that. Eight or nine things went wrong, not one thing. And with Nick's uh, death, that's certainly true. Um, but Nick's life was really rich as well. You know, he, he came from a broken home. I, I, the great story is when he was a year and a half old, his family dog pushed him in the pool and his grandmother went looking around for him and saw him at the bottom of the pool and he had his ears puffed out, like his cheeks puffed out, not his ears, I mean, his cheeks puffed out, his eyes open like with a smile on his face and his grandmother saw him down there, he was perfectly comfortable. And as his parents started fighting as he was growing up, he'd hold the ladder in the family pool and hold himself down until the fighting had subsided. And that the, the water was always his kind of safe place. It was always his, his, where he'd go for, for calmness and serenity. As he grew up, he had a very, you know, he was a great BMX rider. He was gonna try out for the X Games before an injury. He ends up in Philadelphia in 2000 for the GOP National Convention when it was basically, everyone went from the Battle of Seattle to the Philadelphia Convention. So he's with these same people that were working in the WTO protests and he was, he was he was doing that. From there, he met a woman and be, went, moved to New York uh, to try to be an actor in film. He wrote and directed his own film with his girlfriend. He ended up in Williamsburg right after 9-11, like right before Williamsburg became a thing. You know, like it, when he got to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, the downstairs bar at his apartment is where you went to get coke. <laughs> like, that's what it was like, when the, like that's where the New York cops went to like do coke on their off hours and that's, you'd see them come in and out. So he was in Williamsburg when it was still you know, totally derelict. And then he ends up working in production and his first job in production, one of his first jobs on production was to work on a show that was uh, you know, a DC comic that people hadn't really heard of yet, Dave Chappelle. And so he, ran, he was on the whole Chappelle show run. So you know, he, his life all the way up until the point of him discovering free diving is interesting. And so it kind of weaves in and out. It talks about his pull to the sport, but it also profiles the other athletes that you saw in the video, um, Natalia included. And so, uh, and so that's what, you know, that's why I wanted to talk to you guys about it, because it's a sport people don't know that much about, but it's something that we can all do. I mean, I, I'm, I swim in the ocean a lot, so I love the ocean, and I've done some tech diving and scuba diving, but when it came to free diving, it was harder for me to do than I thought it would be. I mean, I'm, I'm in the ocean like four to five days a week, um, but when it came to free diving, it's a different type of experience, and it takes a different attention and different mechanics, um, but when you do it, you feel it, you know, you feel it, so. You, really, you feel like a dolphin. Yeah. And you get to the point where you can dive down 50, 60 feet and, and just be comfortable down there for an extended amount of time. You know, then you, you, you feel like, I mean, it's like, like a superhero or, you know, something. It's like Aquaman, Aquaman right? Yeah, you, you are. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, there's some places. I'm like a beginner, beginner Aquaman. These uh, guys are real Aquaman. One of my favorite places to dive is a spot called Honau Nau Bay that's uh, off uh, near Kona on the big island of Hawaii. And it's where the dolphins, the spinner dolphins, come in during the day to go to sleep. And they swim in these, these big circles around the bay. And if you're out there free diving, you can anticipate by watching where they are um, when they're going to get to you. And so, you know, 20 or 30 seconds before they get there, you can go and swim down uh, 20 meters and just hover in the water and wait for them. And you'll see this entire pod of spinner dolphins come out of the blue at you. And you know the little baby dolphins want to play, and it, you know they can play with bubble rings and, and stuff. It's it's just incredible. Yeah, and that kind of recreational free diving is what most people do. And there's no you don't you can you can love free diving and, and never compete. Like me, for instance, who will never compete, but but um, but you can still get a lot out of it. And before we I, we want to take questions, but before that, I wanted to talk just a few minutes about marine plastic pollution. And I brought little props up here. Um, Last summer, I did a story on Five Gyres. Five Gyres is, I think, one of the world leaders in fighting marine plastic pollution. They're a nonprofit based here in Santa Monica, actually. And I went on this, on this voyage through the North Atlantic Gyre, which we went for an expedition from Bahamas to Bermuda. And along the way, we were trolling through some of the most beautiful blue water 
in the entire, I've ever seen trawling, excuse me, and we have these little, these little trawls, fine mesh trawls that they designed. And in the bluest water I've ever seen, and also on that voyage were people like Kimmy Werner, who's a champion spearfisher woman, and if you have a chance to Google her, Kimmy, K-I-M-I, -I, Werner, she's got amazing footage online. You'll see her riding the tail fin of a great white shark, and among other amazing things. And there were some pro surfers, and, and um, Jack Johnson as well. And, a lot of these people have seen some of the most beautiful ocean landscapes in the world, oceanscapes in the world, and here we were in one of them. Like, none of us had ever seen bluer water, and we would trawl through the, through the water, and we'd come up with microplastics. You know, microplastics, because everywhere in the world now, every, every inch of ocean has microplastics. Every inch of ocean. And what Five Gyres does is tries to study it and then raise awareness, because, and the gyres are these current systems, right? There's five of them in the world, and they're giant wind and water current systems that take all the garbage that has been in rivers, whatever dumped in the marine system, however it is, and they end up in these swirling gyres at the surface. And then they sink, this plastic sinks, and it breaks down because plastic never goes away. Metal, glass, paper, all that stuff disintegrates. Plastic never disintegrates smaller than these micro pieces. They get eaten by fish. They, uh, those fish get eaten by bigger fish, we eat the other fish, so it gets into the food, the food system, and they bioaccumulate toxins in the water, then they sink to deep sea sediment, it's been found in deep sea sediment, it's been, they get in underwater currents and distribute it all over the world, it's been found in Arctic ice cores, and I'm not trying to, I don't really want to preach too heavy, but I will say that it's, in my opinion, the number two, second only to climate change in terms of environmental disasters happening on this earth right now. It's completely man-made, and the only way to stop it is to stop using single-use plastic and to stop producing, a better way is to stop producing single-use plastic. Because, and you go into any grocery store, Whole Foods included, you, it's hard to find stuff that's not wrapped in plastic. It's really hard. And so that's that single-use plastic, and there's no reason for it. And, um, and so I, I have these, I have these little things, these are nurdles. This is what most plastic comes, that's the, that's the initial compound of the plastic that they use to make bottles or anything else, nurdles. And the other thing we should know is 90% of single-use plastic cannot be recycled. And even the non-recycled stuff gets shipped to India and China from here often and gets sorted out and ends up in the water systems out there and then ends up in our marine environment. So it, it's a really broken loop system. It's, it's not a loop system, it's a broken system and the only way is to stop using it. So I, want, I, I, I encourage you to look over there. There's some Five Gyres brochures, and you can take a look at it. FiveGyres.org is the organization, the number FiveGyres.org. And uh, I'll let you guys look at these things, too. Uh, I think it's, it's something that's really close to my heart, someone who loves the ocean. And I, I think we can fix it. I think we can fix it. And we will fix it. And then 20, 30 years after we fix it, when archaeologists go back and take ice cores, they'll see all this plastic, they'll be like, what were these guys using so much plastic for? This is like the Plasticine age that we're in now. Not to alarm you too heavily, but it's true. So here, we'll leave these, and you guys can ask questions if you like. Um, just briefly, a, a tradition at, at the Vertical Blue competition is that one of the days before the comp starts, uh, they'll take everyone out to the beach, which is about a, a quarter mile stretch of beach, and do a beach cleanup. And so everyone gets garbage bags, and you, you fill it up with as much plastic as you can find, and it's, it's absolutely shocking. Yeah, cause, and Long Island is right in the middle of that gyre. We, we, we went by it, and it's right in the middle. So all this plastic is just getting washed up on these beautiful beaches, and it's not being generated by Long Island. It's generated offshore, or different, different islands, different places, mainland America, most likely. So yeah, particularly this, the single-use uh, uh, plastic water containers. Yeah, that so that, that's, that's why you see me sipping out of this behemoth thing and dripping all over myself, right? Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's an easy way. There's easy fixes that we can do. I don't want to put it all on the individual, because the consumer, because really this product should be phased out. Um, but obviously we can all do better, myself included. I was curious about how the sport translates. You know, we're talking about elite athletes. Um, can professional freedivers also, you know, run a half marathon no problem? Is their use of oxygen just like someone who's training at altitude? I'm just curious on how it translates to their sports. Um, it, it depends somewhat on, on which disciplines the athlete is focused on. Uh, some of them are, are more or less, um, you know, would, would translate differently. So for instance, static apnea, there are some people that specialize just in the pure breath hold. And that's sort of the opposite of cardio. And so they've trained their system to 
conserve energy rather than to burn it. Yep. Um, and so for them, it might not translate into a long distance run. Uh, I think a lot of the athletes do more weight training and they, they taper off the cardio before they would really do a free diving competition because the, the uh, physical systems you know, used are, are much different. Um, but in general, the, the best free divers are in, in killer shape, if you were to yeah. go and see them. And often come from a swimming background of some kind. Alexi and Natalia are perfect examples. They were competitive swimmers all their lives. And then um, in, Ale in Natalia's case, she kind of tabled it for 20 years. And in, in, in Alexi's case, he went right from swimming, one of the elite Russian youth swimmers, and ended up being a fin swimmer which is kind of this other sport we don't really know about, but there's actual people who sprint with, with monofins and pools. It's big in Europe and Eastern Europe especially. And, um, and so he did that and that kind of led him into this sport. Uh, in terms of like big, t I mean, it, it would, I think a lot of people in competitive freediving are interested, what if a guy like Michael Phelps decided to start doing this? And there are some college swimmers that have made progress. And, and um, those guys, though, will still come up against the same kind of limiting factors that any average freediver might have. Like, can I equalize below a certain depth? It, are my lungs flexible enough? It, it, it takes time to get down to depth, otherwise you could injure your lungs. Um, so they'll go, bump up against those same roadblocks that will delay them, even if they're athletic. Uh, I think it's more likely that a great athlete that might also do some freediving versus freedivers that will then go on to do other sports um, and a good example are big wave surfers. So a lot of big wave surfers now do apnea and breath hold training and most uh, free diving uh, instruction, you know, PFI included and others, will do surf safety schools where they'll actually work with big wave surfers who might get you know, two wave hold downs or minute hold downs after paddling for a minute where they're, you know, they're anaerobic and they still have to relax and, and endure it. And so that's probably the best correlation. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, is there much uh, crossover from competitive divers to people who do recreational uh, snorkeling. So I think uh, it might, the abilities that you develop would help as a snorkeler, give you more time, more depth, just see more stuff like ocean surface. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, and that's a, a large part of why a lot of free divers do what they do is because they do love the, the snorkeling aspect and just the recreational aspect of getting out on the water and just kind of looking around or, or you know, playing with, with fish or dolphins or something. Uh, you can interact with wildlife a lot better as a free diver than as a scuba diver because the bubbles tend to scare the fish away and you're not as maneuverable. Um, so, yeah, doing it recreationally is a, is a big draw. And I mean, for me, uh, personally, it certainly is. I mean, the competitive aspect is sort of something that I do to have an excuse to go somewhere and be able to free dive for, for a while. It's just that there happens to be a competition happening. But really, I do it leaning more towards the, the recreational end of the, the spectrum. And so it really is advanced snorkeling, really. Yeah, and for spear fishermen, it's a vital tool as well, which is basically what you're saying, but sometimes in blue water. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, William Trubridge uh, is, is interesting. He's pretty much a, a vegan, except for fish that he spears himself. And so <laughs> if he wants protein, he's got to work for it. Yeah. Uh, so. uh, on the uh, snorkeling thing, um, I did do some paddy work with a, a chap whose point of view was the nice thing about doing free diving practice before you go down to the tank is that you don't breathe very often when you're on the tank and it doesn't scare the fish away. So he uses free diving as a way of building up his tolerance so that he can just not breathe for two minutes while he's at depth with the tank on his back. Um, which seemed a useful thing to learn. Um, the thing that I mostly have trouble with when I'm um, snorkeling and trying to get down to depth because is that I'm doing it with a camera. Uh, and I can't see a damn thing without a mask, um, or at least not enough to take a photo anyway. Um, so are there any recommendations for how to handle the fact that um, I end up putting an awful lot of the air that was in my lungs in my mask in order to be able to still not have water in my mask and be able to see for the camera? I mean, the, I've seen low volume masks, but they don't seem to be particularly low volume compared to what my lungs are like by the time I'm down there. Mm -hmm. um. A lot of professional or a lot of uh, competitive free divers, uh, when they're doing particularly deep dives, actually trans, uh, transfer to using fluid goggles instead of an air-filled mask. So the idea is you just have regular swim goggles. You put very thick lenses in them so that when you flood them with saline or with seawater, you can still everything you know adapts and you can still see clearly. And so that's one way to go about that. Uh, some of the free diving masks, there's there's one call uh, a type of mask called a sphera that's common, it's, it's like 50 bucks, it's, it's a fairly cheap mask, but it's plastic, it has plastic lenses. 
Uh, it kind of scratches if you breathe on it, but it is very low volume and it has, uh, it's curved, so it warps things a little bit in your peripheral vision, uh, but it does sort of squeeze right onto your face as you go down and it uses very little air to equalize it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's one a lot of the uh, competitive free divers use if they're doing sort of medium depth or if they're, um, and some divers uh, have set world records in masks. Uh, Martin Stepanek did 120 something meters, right? In, Wow. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, and you just breathe out your nose a little bit, and that's enough with a sphera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. That was riveting. Um, the uh, couple questions. Um, one, you talk about the danger when you're coming up, but it seems like when you are negatively buoyant, and you need, I, I'm, it sounds like you don't have the uh, rescue divers down there either. Right. You're all on your own to get back up. Is that a problem, or do pip people typically have enough experience not to exhaust themselves? Well, it's not a problem because of the way physics works with pressure. So the way physics works is as you go down deeper and deeper, your lungs are shrinking. And so the brain feels like you have plenty of oxygen. Your partial pressure of oxygen in your bloodstream is actually up. So with every depth, every, every, every atmosphere of pressure that you add, the partial pressure goes up. And so the, your system is like, okay, we have plenty of oxygen. We have plenty, we're gonna be fine. We're gonna keep operating. And then at the depth, when they start coming back, the reverse happens, right? Yeah. The reason you wouldn't have um, divers on tanks at that depth is because, as you know, you can get decompression sickness if you are on a tank and you're way deep. So you wouldn't be able to do anything with that diver anyway. There are some competitions, Deja Blue, which is run by Performance Free Diving, that does have Diver, tech divers on tanks at those deep depths, and they'll shake the line if something horrible happens. Um, and there is the line, too. So if a safety diver goes down to 30, 35 meters and doesn't see his diver coming and knows that the diver is supposed to come at a certain time because there, there's a time thing estimate that they know, um, then they can shake the line, and the diver is attached by lanyard to the line, and they can pull the diver out that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are issues like that. You know, um, in the book, I talk about a, a diver um, in the Caribbean competition in 2014 that he actually, his lanyard, it wasn't a quick, quick release. Often they have quick release Velcro lanyards they can pull in if it gets knotted. And he gets knotted at the bottom plate and can't get out. And for a minute, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And so there, that happens, you know. And, um, and so that's when you shake the line and pull them up. There, there was one crazy incident uh, in a comp a few years ago where a diver uh, went to go do a dive, and on the way down, the lanyard got disconnected from the line. And so as he's falling down towards the bottom plate, he's drifting away from the line, just off into the blue. And uh, I guess at some point realized that he was lost and started to turn around and started trying to swim back up, but he was a little disoriented down there and was actually swimming sideways and not making any vertical progress at all and by sheer luck, managed to swim into the next competition line over, climb up that line all the way to the surface. It was in good enough shape to get all the way to the top. Uh, so yeah, if, if you come unclipped, that's, you know, that's a problem. It's a problem, and it, and it just shows that with this sport, there's already a very thin margin for error. And if you put yourself in, and what some people, it just, they just kind of lose track of priorities. I think Nick did that um, towards the end. And, if, and you can operate where all of a sudden there's no margin for error. And that's what happened with, also with Natalia, though. So it's not just upstarts. You know, Natalia is the most decorated athlete ever, and she also had it. So I think it's important for all of us to kind of look at our lives. Where, where, are we, where are we overvaluing and what are we overvaluing? And like try to maintain perspective because um, you know, that, that, that's kind of a lesson for everybody, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, even if you try to dive safely, if you try to set up your dives so that you say that there's a 1% chance that something will go seriously wrong. If you do 100 dives, chances are you're going to hit that 1% yeah. on one of the dives. And so okay. it's a reason to be very careful. Last question. Yeah, so my question is about like, uh, recreational diving. So like with scuba, uh, say I'm on a dive trip, your limiting factor is buildup of oxygen and nitrogen in your blood. So like when you're free diving on a trip, like assuming you're well within what your comfort level is, say 30 meter or whatever, like how many dives do you do to that depth? What's kind of a regimen of like a normal recreational dive trip? Uh, it depends on your level of, of, of fitness. I mean, there's a lot of uh, spear fishermen that will go out and do, you know, 
20, 30 of those type of dives in a row, a um, tank can probably answer that question as a, as a Spiro. Um, 50, 60, 60 dives. dives. If, if, you're, if you're in, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, because I, I don't really cover that in this, but if you're in the 20 to 30 meter range, you'd have to do a lot of dives to get the kind of uh, bubble buildup in your blood like you would if you're, if you're getting, if you're on a bottle, if you're on air tank breathing at depth. That's where decompression sickness is much more likely. I've only, I only saw decompression sickness once in the entire research of this, of this book, and it was with a diver who had done repeated 100 meter plus dives day after day. It was last year. And, and um, he did 100 meter plus day after day after day, and so that buildup of that is what gave him some very minor decompressions. He didn't have to do a chamber. He, he, well, he maybe did a day or two in the chamber in Nassau, and then he was completely fine. So decompression sickness can happen if they're weighted on sleds and they're going 200 plus meters or something like that on the way, but then it can happen. But it's much more common in breathing air. That's why often freedivers will say it's actually more dangerous, and statistically it is more dangerous to be on a tank at depth than it is to be off a tank at depth. Because, yeah, if you need to go up quickly, you'll Because you can yourself. go up quickly and you won't hurt yourself, yeah, exactly. Uh, but for recreational diving, even if you're diving within your limits, that assumes that every dive is going to go according to plan. And the problem is if you go down and you get distracted by something and you're down longer than you think and suddenly you realize I'm 50 feet down and, you know, I'm out of air and, you know, that, that's when uh, trouble can, can happen. So yeah. it's, it's, it's so important to always have somebody watching you totally. when you're diving who knows how to do a rescue and, and so on. One up, one down, they say. And before we go, I just wanted to say thank you. I want to thank Google because, you know, writing is a team sport. It seems like the most solitary thing in the world, but especially a book like this where it relies on so many sources to be so open, including these guys here, everyone here, and um, obviously readers and bookstores and that kind of thing. But, you know, Google spending time doing this and, and inviting me here and having you guys take your time, it, it's, that's right there with it. And I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful. I know every author that comes here must feel that way. Uh, I certainly do, so I really want to thank you guys for coming. And if you want, I'll sign some books over there, and I'll have these little plastic toys for you to check out if you want. Okay. And, yeah.